Hello, my name is Andrew Lane. I'm from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School. This presentation is on recognizing and managing capillary leak syndrome. Capillary leak syndrome is a multi-system disorder that results from damage to endothelial cells in blood vessels, which causes protein-rich fluid to move from the intravascular space into the extravascular space. This can lead to subsequent problems such as edema, effusions, ascites, muscle damage, including rhabdomyolysis, and acute kidney injury. In some situations, capillary leak syndrome, or CLS, is a result of cytokine activity that causes this leakage of endothelial cells. However, in cancer therapy, certain chemotherapy agents may directly damage the endothelium and lead to capillary leak syndrome. This includes conventional chemotherapy and bacterial toxin-containing agents, such as Tigraxafusp, which was recently approved for BPDCN. In patients with BPDCN receiving Tigraxafusp that had capillary leak syndrome, it was associated with a clinical syndrome of one or more of the following symptoms, hypoalbuminemia, edema, weight gain, and hypotension. In the 94 patients who received Tigraxafusp in several clinical trials that were part of the FDA approval process for Tigraxafusp, there were 55% of patients who had CLS of any grade. 46% of those patients had grade one or two CLS, 6% grade three, 1% grade four, and two patients out of 94 had fatal CLS. Of interest, CLS has also been seen with other cancer agents, such as deniluconin diftytox, which is interleukin-2 conjugated to diphtheria toxin, and moxatumumab pseudotox, which is an antibody toxin conjugate of anti-CD22 conjugated to pseudomonas toxin, which suggests that the capillary leak is related to the toxin portion of these drugs, or perhaps to targeting certain cell surface proteins. When using Tigraxafusp for BPDCN, there are several strategies that one can use to mitigate the risk of capillary leak syndrome. They include prevention, recognition, and intervention. So for prevention, these are selection criteria for patients who perhaps should not receive Tigraxafusp because of the increased risk should they have capillary leak syndrome. So patients should have adequate cardiac function as measured by a normal ejection fraction to receive Tigraxafusp. The serum albumin should be greater than or equal to 3.2 grams per deciliter, and the serum creatinine should be less than or equal to 1.8 milligrams per deciliter or a creatinine clearance of greater than 60 milliliters per minute. For patients who then go on to receive Tigraxafusp, early recognition of the signs and symptoms of capillary leak syndrome are very important. First, the first cycle of treatment should be administered in an inpatient setting for increased monitoring. That monitoring should be performed prior to each daily dose of Tigraxafusp and include monitoring of serum albumin, patient's weight, physical exam for peripheral or pulmonary edema, and vital signs for hypotension or hemodynamic instability. The daily dose of Tigraxafusp should be withheld if there are any signs or symptoms of capillary leak syndrome. And the third step is intervention. If a patient has signs or symptoms of capillary leak, in addition to holding Tigraxafusp, they could receive albumin, steroids, or aggressive fluid management, depending on the clinical situation. This table is adapted from the FDA label for the approval of Elzonris or Tigraxafusp and it gives instructions for how to approach the monitoring of capillary leak syndrome and the actions to be taken. So first, if a patient's serum albumin is less than 3.2 grams per deciliter, they should not be initiated onto Tigraxafusp. During Tigraxafusp dosing, if the albumin drops below certain pre-specified levels or a certain drop from the patient's own albumin level at the start of the cycle, patients should have Tigraxafusp held and albumin should be given. If the weight increases, or if there is edema, fluid overload, or hypotension, patients should receive albumin and have aggressive fluid status management, 
which could include diuretics or IV fluids depending on the clinical assessment, and should consider giving corticosteroids. The implications for tigraxifus dosing are that the dosing should be held until all signs or symptoms of capillary leak syndrome have resolved, and this could potentially delay treatment or result in no further treatment in a given cycle. After patients recover from capillary leak syndrome, tigraxifusp may resume. This could be within a given cycle if all CLS signs or symptoms have resolved and there was no hemodynamic instability, or it could be in a subsequent cycle. Within a given cycle, dosing can be given and may be given up to 10 days, which allows for delays to receive all five doses as planned. Tigraxifus may resume in subsequent cycles if capillary leak syndrome signs and symptoms have resolved. Importantly, alanine aminotransferase and aspartate aminotransferase liver function elevations are common with tigraxifus as well. 82% and 79% of patients receiving the drug had ALT or AST elevations of all grades, and 30% and 37% were greater than or equal to grade 3. If ALT or AST are greater than five times the upper limit of normal, tigraxifus should be discontinued for the remainder of the cycle. It can resume in subsequent cycles if it resolves to less than or equal to 2.5 times the upper limit of normal. Also importantly, ALT and AST elevation are not necessarily linked to capillary leak syndrome, but they may be seen with capillary leak syndrome. So to summarize, capillary leak syndrome, or CLS, is an important toxicity of tigraxifusp. The incidence of CLS may be reduced by careful patient selection. Recognition of CLS is very important to cause withholding tigraxifusp at least temporarily. And CLS management involves one or more of giving albumin, steroids, or aggressive fluid status management with diuretics or IV fluids as the clinical situation mandates. Thank you for your attention.